Monday only from 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. So here's the new schedule. She used to TA from 3 to 4 on Mondays. That'll now be from 5 to 6, right? So there's that update. So all the syllabuses on Canvas have been updated to reflect this new change. I also made an announcement. Um, some, another student came and asked me about what calculators are allowed to be used in this class. The only requirement is that it can't communicate wirelessly with another calculator, right? Which most of the manufacturers are smart enough not to make that because they're not allowed anywhere. Um, that said, you should be using a calculator that has a solver on it, right? Um, I get the number one uh, comment I get from people who are thinking about engineering but are like a little bit turned off. They're like, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm just not very good at math. I'm just not very analytical. It's like. I don't care, you don't have to be, right? You really don't have to be. Nowadays, we live in an age where software and computers do all of this for us. So for example, I'm using the same TI-89 since I've had since high school. And if you don't own something TI-89 or better, I'd make a plea for you to, to, to buy one. It's 150 bucks or something. You're gonna spend $4,000 this semester on tuition. And this will make your life so much easier. It can do derivatives, it can do integrals. It, even better, it can do derivatives and integrals with units, right? So if you take the derivative of an energy with respect to time, it will give you the right, okay, right. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> I don't even have any idea. Is there like a... No, it's not coming for me, I'm VGA. I've got nothing turned on. That's another class. Let's just, Let's just see where this goes. <laughs> uh, media is all the way down. Is there like a button in the back somewhere? This is a new one for me. Is there are like no buttons anywhere. No. Can you see if that's coming from next door? All right, I have no idea where that's coming from. We'll get to the bottom of it, or maybe Emily will. Exactly. Sorry, in the meantime, that's obnoxious. One more plug to buy one of these because it'll do derivatives and integrals and it'll correct the units appropriately, right? So if you take the derivative of the energy, you should get a force. It will do that. It'll spit out the answer of forces. You can convert between things. It'll make your life easier. So you don't have to by any means, but I think it's a no-brainer. You should get that. Okay. Um, the recorded lectures will be posted on YouTube because we've only got a five gigabyte max on Canvas I can put and each lecture is like 500 megabytes. So they will go onto YouTube, and the links are on the course webpage under the file section. That is really obnoxious. Sorry about that. Okay, and then one student found a problem with the book. One of the equations in the book needs to be corrected. Equation 16.17 should look like this. They have a problem where they have a... They have that as a 2. That should actually be a 1, right? So... Should not be a two. It should be a one. That's equation sixteen point seventeen. Oh, it's somebody else's microphone. That's interesting. How is my mic? I turned off my microphone volume. Can you hear me okay without that? If I talk loud, I will talk loud. That's much better. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So let's talk about the learning objectives for today. We left off last time. We decided that there's two. Driving forces in the whole universe. There's entropy and there's enthalpy. Somebody remind me what was what? Harrison, can I pick on you? Do you remember what was what? Entropy is the That's enthalpy. Enthalpy. Yeah, that's enthalpy. And what was entropy? Entropy is um, everything's tendency towards disorder. Yeah, it's a, it's quantitatively, if we could assign a number to it, and chemists have figured out a way to do that, it's how much disorder is present, right? So that's our two driving forces. We know that things want to be disordered or ordered. Disordered. disordered. And things, generally speaking, want to be exothermic. They want to give heat off for it to be spontaneous. So there's these two things. We're going to introduce a new uh, concept called Gibbs-free energy as a unifying energy that accounts for both of these, and that's the one that we really need to care about as engineers. I'll talk about the even Gibbs free energy. Let me figure out if my microphone is picking up somebody else's classroom. So I just turn my microphone off, and we'll talk loud. Okay? Um, even though Gibbs free energy takes into account entropy and enthalpy, it itself has two aspects. It has a theoretical aspect and a, an experimental aspect, and we'll describe what that means by the end of class. 
Um, we'll talk about the reaction coefficient, sometimes called the reaction quotient. And that, uh, that tells you whether or not something goes forward or backward based off experimental conditions. And then we will, at the very end, we'll probably talk about a little bit of electrochemistry. We'll start that and next class period we'll finish it. So that said, let's pick up last time. Uh, last time we said that there's this enthalpy, right, for a substance, but there's also reactions, right? So the very first thing we need to talk about is Hess's law, which says that the total entropy or the total enthalpy changes for a reaction are constant, whether they're done in one or more step, right? So let's say we want to make this compound, right? Or we want to know the entropy or the enthalpy associated with that reaction, right? We're starting out with phosphorus. Uh, it's already been bonded with chlorine, but we can add more chlorine and, and just add more to the chemical formula, right? So I'm going to write out two equations. The first one is 2P plus 5Cl2. I don't know if this video is recording. Yep, I think it is. The mouse usually doesn't work well. Gives us 2PCl5. Okay. And we won't worry about whether they're solids or gases right now. And I can write down a change of enthalpy for that reaction. That would be, if I were able to do a bomb calorimetry, that measures how much heat is generated or absorbed by this reaction taking place. And it would tell us that the change of enthalpy, delta RH, for the reaction, that's what that subscript R means, for the whole reaction, what's the change in heat? Well, it says that it's equal to negative 887 kilojoules. Okay? Now I'm going to write a second reaction. And this one says... 2-phosphorus combining with 3-Cl2s to give us 2-PCl3. Well, the enthalpy of reaction for that one is negative 640. Oops. Sorry. Negative 640 kilojoules. So the first question is, if you take chlorine and phosphorus, put it in a chamber, which one will uh, happen? Which, which of these two reactions should take place? The first one, why? So you raise your the white V-neck. What's your name again? Martin. Mar Martin. Martin? Yeah. Martin. Why does that happen? Because it releases more energy. Yeah, it has a lower, it gives off more energy, right? Delta H is a lower, more negative value. So it's the one that's favorable. Now the question is, how could I use these two reactions to figure out the change of enthalpy for the one that's circled, right? How could I use those? How could I combine those two? Any ideas? So Danielle did this, which I think means switch one of them. <laughs> so switch the bottom one, and then when you add them together, let's do that. So let's switch it first. Let's change the color. So then we say 2PCl3, 3Cl2 plus 2P. What do I have to do to the enthalpy of the reaction? It's got to become positive, right? Meaning if that reaction goes forward, as it's written up here, it's going to give heat off. And if we write it in reverse, it has to absorb that energy. So switching the sign should make sense, right? Now if I add these two together, these go away. That turns into two. And we're left with, if we add these up, let's change color again. We've got 2P. Oh, sorry, the P's cancel as well. We've got 2PCL3. Um, what's uncanceled? Two chlorines giving rise to 2PCL5. Wait, is that right? Yeah. So what do I need to do? Is that, are we good to go? No, it's got, it's double the amount that we actually want. So I need to divide that by two. So if I were to take the sum of these things, what is somebody with a calculator? Negative 887 plus 640. Negative 247. Negative 247 equals negative 247 kilojoules, right? But since we need to divide that by two, we also divide the enthalpy by two, right? So by the time we do one more step, we say PCL3 plus Cl2 giving rise to PCL5. That equals negative 123.5 kilojoules. Okay, this makes sense? That's Hess's law. It says if you want to figure something out and I give you a bunch of steps, if you can rearrange those steps, switching it makes it negative, multiplying it multiplies the enthalpies. But if it adds together and you get the right reaction, then you can do those same steps to the enthalpy values and get the right enthalpy for the reaction. Okay? Therefore, is this reaction favorable? Yeah, this one's favorable as well. Okay, so where do these values come from? Well, there are tabulated values that exist for standard enthalpies 
and entropies of formations for compounds. So we can use those values to write out entire reactions. Up here, I gave you, I gave you a value for the reaction, but what I'm telling you right now is that there are tables where every one of these individual things are tabulated, and we can calculate for the whole reaction as well. And they're not so bad to do. I'll write out the equation just a second. Where do you find them? Um, there's lots. You can just Google thermodynamic enthalpy table, enthalpy of formation, entropy of formation. There's a couple here that I've found that are pretty good. They're pretty exhaustive, actually. Like, a lot of materials are here, kind of alphabetically, right? There's another one on Wikipedia. It's not bad. Something to have in mind. The enthalpy of formation, delta H naught, F, that's the enthalpy of formation. That Those four letters are four different things. Delta means the, that something happens. It's the change, right? So the change in enthalpy, which is what we want. F means of formation, and the naught means under standard conditions. So one atmosphere and temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, right? That will be zero for all elemental substances. Why? The reason it's zero for elemental substances is because by definition, that's the change in enthalpy as you form this compound from its elemental constituents. So if you're going from elemental constituents to elemental constituent, the same thing, there's no change in enthalpy. So the change is by definition zero, okay? So if I ever ask, if I ever give you a question where you have to calculate change of enthalpy for a reaction, and I don't give you, say, oxygen, O2 gas, you can just say that's zero, because O2 gas, that's elemental oxygen, right? Entropy also can be defined, and those exist as well. So let's do it. Let's do it for this example. We're going to take nitrogen gas plus hydrogen gas, and we're going to form ammonia, right? So first off, what are the how, – well, how do we add these things together? For a reaction, you need two formulas. The first one is this, that the delta R H naught. So that's the change in enthalpy for the reaction, and naught means under standard conditions, right? is going to be equal to the sum of delta H naught of the products minus the sum of delta H naught of the reactions. And then the same thing, but for entropy, delta R S naught is going to be equal to the sum of delta S naught same thing. Products minus reactants for both of them. Okay. Make sense? Fair enough? So how do we do it here? Let's assign values first. If you, for some reason, didn't couldn't remember that nitrogen zero, I wonder if these tables will even say it. Yeah. N2 gas right here. What is its enthalpy of formation? DHF naught. It, it reminds you that that's just zero, right? So let's do, let's do the first one. Let's say delta... Let's change back to green. Be consistent. Delta R H. Like that. That's going to be equal to products minus reactants. So we look up ammonia first. NH3. NH3 is right here, and it says for one mole of ammonia, it's negative 46.11 kilojoules per mole. Right. So negative 46.11 kilojoules per mole. So that was for one mole. But how many moles do we have in our reaction? We've got two, so you got to multiply that by two, right? Times two moles, right? So the moles cancel, and we're just left with an energy, okay? Then we're going to minus our products, or sorry, our reactants, excuse me. So we know that nitrogen is zero, and what about hydrogen? It should also be zero, right? So zero plus three times zero, that gives us our total value for the delta, the change in enthalpy for the reaction of ammonia, okay? So that's not so bad. It's just going to be, what, negative almost 100, right? Any questions on that? What's the value? Negative 46 times 2, something like negative 92. Negative 92 kilojoules. So that reaction, as written up here, gives off 92 kilojoules, right? Have I messed something up? No, that's right. Yeah, negative 2 kilojoules. 92 kilojoules. Okay, how do we do it with entropy? So, question, does entropy also have to be zero for elemental substances? It definitely does not, because even though a gas is in its elemental state, if it's a gas molecule, right, like uh, like H2 and N2, they still have entropy. They still have a lot of disorder associated with them. So in this table, you'll find that the, that the S naught value is not zero for nitrogen. In fact, it's a large number because it's a gas, right? So we do the exact same thing, but now for entropy, let's write it out. Oh, gosh. 
gosh, I'm gonna be done. Okay, so for entropy of our reaction, change in entropy, it's gonna be equal to, we look up ammonia. Ammonia is 192.45, it's a positive value. 192.45, is that kilojoules? Kilojoules, or sorry, that's joules per, per Kelvin mole. Because the units of entropy are joules per K, and that's, that's per mole. We're gonna take that and multiply it by two. Right now, we have to do nitrogen, which is 191.61, 191.61 joules per k mole, and then plus three times whatever hydrogen is. Let's look it up. Hydrogen, we just passed it, is 130.684 joules per k mole. Okay. So we plug that in, it's going to give us some value, right? Any questions on how to do this? So if I gave you a table like this on an exam, and I wrote out some, comp some formula, just like the formation of ammonia, I could ask you to calculate enthalpy and entropy and tell me whether or not one is, are, are they both driving forces or is one actually retarding the formation of the products? And to do that, all you have to see is, is this change, is entropy the net change growing in entropy? Does entropy get larger? And does the exact does the reaction give off energy? Those are the two things that we're going to be looking for. Okay, so which one actually dominates? We need to combine these two together, right? We already said the enthalpy and entropy both matter. So how do we combine them together? We use Gibbs free energy, right? Gibbs is the name of a guy. Um, unless I'm mistaken, people, I think he was the first engineering PhD in the United States. So he was very very long ago. I can't remember if it's from Yale or Princeton, but he's the very first engineering PhD, I think. And he's sort of the father of uh, thermodynamics. He did a lot of work in heat and energy, and so they named this variable after him because he realized that both those values had to come together. It is given by G equals H minus TS, right? H is enthalpy. That's not the change in entropy, right, or enthalpy. That's just ent enthalpy. And S is entropy, not the change in entropy. Change would be the delta sign in front of it, right? So that's Gibbs free energy. So if you consider a generic reaction, we're, we'll come back to this in a few times, where we have... Na moles of compound A. A could be hydrogen or nitrogen or ammonia or whatever, right? We have this many moles of it, N sub A, and we've got N sub B number of moles of compound B, N sub Y, N sub Z, and so forth, right? So these are our products, or sorry, reactants and products over here. You might, it's a fair question to ask then, what should G be a function of? Well, we know that the same things that entropy and enthalpy are a function of are going to be involved, right? We know that en enthalpy equals u plus pv from last class and we know that now g equals h minus ts so we could rewrite that as u plus pv minus ts right so all of these things are going to be important so temperature and pressure but also the number of moles present also change the free energy what does this mean it means that if i if this reaction goes forward this number of moles is going to go down this one's going to go down this will go up and that will go up and if we did that at constant temperature and pressure, then neither of these things would be changing, T and P, just the number of moles would change, and that would influence the total change in free energy, okay? We'll come back to that when we talk about uh, phase diagrams, but basically the concept is this, that the change in free energy, we're gonna write out with the partial D, so the partial derivative of free energy with respect to temperature, if we hold uh, pressure and the number of moles constant for all the different substances, then we get negative S dt. And if we take the partial derivative of free energy with respect to, now this time, pressure, holding temperature and the number of moles of each component constant, then that is V dp. We'll come back to that. This will be really important in the next chapter. So how do we take... The, how do we change the free energy as N, A, and B, and Y, and N, Z change? We need to introduce a new concept for that. It's called the chemical potential or the partial molar free energy. Partial molar free energy just because you take the partial derivative of free energy, but with respect to the number of moles of each of these components, right? So that's called chemical potential. So D, G, D, N, if you hold everything constant except for N, A, then you get the chemical potential of species A. And you can do this for species B, species Y, species Z, okay? Every one of those is going to have a chemical potential. 
in terms of uh, how do you describe it, if somebody asked you at the end of the, the lecture class today, what is chemical potential, we'd all sort of shrug our shoulders and say something about a derivative and some number of moles maybe. An easier, more intuitive way to think of it is what is chemical potential? It's the change in energy of the system if I add or remove one of those components, right? I've got a, I've got a vessel that has gasoline and oxygen in it that can combust, right? So how does the free energy of that system change if I take out one mole of oxygen? That would be the chemical potential of oxygen, right? Assuming everything else stays the same, okay? All right, so that means if you hold T and P constant, then the change in free energy is just going to be equal to the partial, so the chemical potential, that's just the partial molar free energy of component A multiplied by the change of the moles of number A, right? So if you take out one mole of A, you have to multiply it by its chemical potential. We have to do the same thing for B. We're going to say the chemical potential of compound B times the change in number, I think we wrote that lowercase, sorry. Change the number of moles of B chemical potential of Y times the change in the number of moles of Y plus the chemical potential of Z times the change in the number of moles of Z, right? Okay, why do we minimize Gibbs free energy? We'll skip that. Let's talk about, finally we get to this. The free energy equation depends on both a theoretical component and an experimental component. So to wake everybody up, or it's been 10 minutes of boring math, so tell your neighbor, why should there be both an, a theoretical and an experimental component to free energy? Best, your best guess. Okay, so I don't know what your neighbor and you guys came up with. Anybody feel brave and want to answer this one? Or at least take a stab at it? What do you think, Matt? Um, can you use both so that it can kind of bring it to the middle so that one side doesn't skew it to one or the other? Yeah. Did you, I saw another hand over here. Was it Jackson? Jake? Jake. Jake. You'll never have exactly standard conditions. Okay. For one thing, temperature, right? Non-standard conditions, right? So the theoretical values, these all, like if we go back to our table, these are at 298.15 Kelvin, right? If you do your reaction at 350 Kelvin, then these are all now off, right? So you need to account for that. That's one reason. And then the other one was what, was what Matt said, meaning if I understood you, that there's like an equilibrium that as you're going to move forward and backwards from an equilibrium. And those are the two exactly right answers. First one is you have to account for temperature, right? And the second one is you have to account for how much of your species are actually present. As I was telling this guy over here, remember your name? Jared. Jared. I was telling Jared, I could write down the reaction for gasoline plus oxygen yielding CO2 and H2O. And we know that that's exothermic. We know it happens because we do it in our cars all the time. So you'd say that reaction will go forward. But there's a scenario where that reaction won't go forward. Like, for example, what if there's no oxygen present in the, in the vessel? It doesn't matter what the paper says. If there's no oxygen present in the actual the experimental vessel where this is happening, the reaction won't go forward, right? So it takes into account the number of moles present. So our equation right here has two components. It has the, let me change this. I'll do, oh gosh. Oh, what have I done? Making it worse. Okay, we have the experimental, which I'll do red. That's this part right here. And then we've got the theoretical, right? So the total change, the total change in free energy for a reaction, not the change in free energy not, which is at standard conditions, just the total free energy of reaction depends on what it should be under standard conditions. This is basically as it's written on paper, knowing nothing about what's in the research vessel. And then plus RT natural log Q. Q is the reaction quotient. And that basically says what's actually in the vessel, what, how much of the different materials are present, right? You need both of those things. You can't just do one or the other. You need both of them, okay? 
So where does this law, where does this come from is a, is a fair question. We'll get to that in just a second. First, let me write out what Q is. What is our reaction quotient? Anybody seen this? You have to take Gen Chem 2 to see this. Anybody have seen this? Martin or uh, Simone. Simone. Um, the, uh, the concentration of your products raise their stoichiometric coefficient divided by concentration. Of the reactants. reactants yeah. yeah, it's products over reactants. So Q is going to equal products over reactants. And then he said something else. Sorry, that's bad handwriting. That it's raised to the number of moles, right? So if we go back to our generic expression, we'd say that this is Y, whatever Y is, ammonia gas or whatever, raised to the number of moles of Y, right? And then Z multiplied by Z raised to the number of moles of Z. That's our products. Our reactants were A raised to the number of moles of A times B raised to the number of moles of B, okay? So that is how you calculate Q, the reaction quotient. So what would it be for our generic reaction? We just wrote it, okay? Now we have to modify this. If some of the materials are either solids or liquids, we need to modify it, right? Um, if they're gases, it's easy enough. You just do the, you use the partial pressure, right? So for us, it would be the partial pressure of gas A raised to the number of moles of A times the partial pressure, oh, I'm sorry, that's Z. Sorry to throw you off. Y and Z. Y, Z, raised to the number of moles of Z. If they're all gases, then it's easy still. Number of moles of A. Partial pressure of B. Number of moles of B. What is a partial pressure, real quick, if you've forgotten this from chemistry? How do we figure out partial pressure? I didn't hear it. Partial pressure is just what the name suggests. In this room, what is the composition of air, real quick? What is air made of? 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and less than 1% of everything else. So like the hydrogen, the, the, the ammonia, all that is all less than 1%, and it's a good thing, right? So the partial pressure of something, partial pressure of A, would just be the pressure of compound A divided by partial pressure of A, partial pressure of B, partial pressure of Y, partial pressure of Z. So it's over the total pressure. So in this room... Since we know that 78% of the, the air is nitrogen, what's the partial pressure of nitrogen? It's just 78, right? Partial pressure of nitrogen is 78 divided by one atmosphere. It's just 0.78, right? And it would be 0.21 for oxygen. So that's pH of different things in that equation? Over here, uh, same right thing. Hand side, you've got pH equals pH over this, all that stuff. It could be the total pressure, whereas on the left, when you divide it by the... So this... I see, I see, I see your question. This here is total pressure. And this is individual pressure. Right? So if you had a vessel that's at room pressure, this is one atmosphere. If you had a pressure, if you're a chemical engineer and you're baking up something under high pressure and you've got, you know, 10 pascals of pressure or whatever it is, if you know that uh, 8 of those pascals correspond to something, but there's 10 total, then 8 over 10 is your partial pressure. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Fair enough. Does that make sense? Are there questions about this still? So that's your partial pressure. So writing out the reaction quotient for this reaction up here that we just did would be simple. What would be the reaction quotient for this one right here? Somebody want to take a stab at telling me what to write? So, Ali, can I pick on you? What would be the reaction quotient for this reaction? We'd say that Q equals, it's going to be products over reactants. So it'd be, they're all gases. So we're going to say what? Partial pressure of which one first? Am I, are you Allie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if you're looking at me or not. Yeah. Um, um, it'd be the partial pressure of um, ammonia gas gas. Partial pressure of ammonia. Do we have to raise it to anything? Um, to this has got to be squared because there's yeah. two moles of it, right? And then... What's this divided by? Uh, that's it. That's all it takes, right? So that's, that's not so bad to do. So if you could actually monitor the partial pressure of gases in a reaction, you could tell what Q was. And once you know what Q was in the temperature, coming back down here, all of a sudden we can say whether or not a reaction happens, right? Does this reaction happen? Well, it'll depend on whether it should happen on paper, that's the delta Rg naught, the 
the free energy of formation under standard conditions plus temperature plus Q, right? And we'll, we'll know whether it actually happens. It gets a little bit trickier with solids or liquids. It actually simplifies it, but something more to remember. How it changes is that there's no partial pressure of a solid, right? Right? Yeah, question? Is it um, yeah. Kylie? Kylie? I said a question on the equation with your PA equals PA over the total pressure. Yeah. Um, what does piece of A refer to? Because it seems like you know you can have like piece of A equals piece of A in the equation, but I think I have I should be changing it. I should say the pressure of A, right? Let's call it pressure A. We'll just do uppercase like that, right? And then P sub A is the partial pressure of A. Okay. Does that make sense? So, what is the so these, again, would be, let's rewrite it. Sorry for the, the confusion here. PA plus PB plus PY plus PZ, where that's the, just the pressure. Whatever the value is, whether that's at atmosphere or whether that's in a reaction vessel or under vacuum, doesn't matter. It's just the actual value of what pressure that gas is exerting on its system. Okay. From chemistry, how do we calculate the pressure that a gas exerts on its system if we know how many moles of it there are? We use the ideal gas law, right? So which tells us that um, PV equals nRT. So if we know that the total vessel has, say, 800 pascals of pressure, or some number, right? That's our pressure. If you know that uh, it has some volume, it's one liter, for example, and you know gas constant and temperature, you can calculate how many moles of gas must be present, right? So if you have three gases in a vessel, and you know the exact number of moles of each of those in the temperature, you can figure out what pressure it should exert on its, on its chamber, right? And this is actually a pretty good ballpark estimate. In the real world, the ideal gas law needs to be replaced by non-ideal gases, because gases aren't perfect all the time. And so if you take PCAM, you'll learn a lot, a lot, a lot about that. But for our class, ideal gas law is not a bad way to start. If I say that there is one mole of gas in a one liter vessel at 300 Kelvin, What's the pressure that it's exerting on its walls? You'd say, you do ideal gas law, you'd spit out P equals whatever that is. If I say, in addition, there are half as many moles of this other substance, what's the pressure of it? And then finally, what's the partial pressure? You would just say pressure of component A divided by the total pressure. That would be partial pressure of A. Pressure of component B divided by the total pressure, that'd be the partial pressure of component B. Does this make sense? If this is at all like seeming uh, daunting to you. The TAs can do lots and lots of examples during office hours. So I'll move on for now. Maybe one more question from, I forgot your name, Calvin? Yeah. Calvin. So the partial pressure of component B is just the pressure that that's exerting, that component is exerting on? The pressure that it has. Like it's going to have some chamber, right? In this room, the chamber is just the walls of this room, right? And so we are all solids, right? But there's gases in here as well. So the question, and this leads to the next question, like how do we modify this reaction for solids, right? Like I could ask what's the partial pressure of Jared, but Jared's a solid, right? So unless you're a solid that has a really, really high vapor pressure, like what? What can we think of that's a solid that has a high vapor pressure? Like methanol, something that you can smell it very easily. That's a liquid. A solid would be something like dry ice, right? Things sublimating very, very rapidly. So it has a definitely non-zero partial pressure. It has a, a measurable partial pressure. For most solids and liquids, we can say that the partial pressure is one compared to everything else, which makes our, re our reaction easier. What does the reaction quotient become? Well, if A and Y were both either solids or liquids, we just replace them by one instead of writing out their partial pressure. That makes our life easier. It means it's one raised to the NY times partial pressure of Z raised to the NZ. Down here, it's one raised to the NA times partial pressure of B to the NB, which is just going to be PZ raised to the NZ over PB raised to the NB. Is this true? Is this mathematically correct? No way. Because, well, from this equation it is, but is this a fair assumption? Is writing one here true? No, it's an approximation. Every solid and liquid is going to have some vapor pressure, right? We're just going to assume that it's very, very small compared to the gas at present. And in cases like dry ice, that assumption would be totally bad. It would mess up, right? But for a lot of things, it works. And until you guys take thermal and learn about how to learn about activities, which is the correct way to deal with this and not just giving a value of one, we're just going to call it one for this class. Okay, fair enough? So if I give you a, a reaction, look at the subscript, right? Go back to our, uh, our ammonia synthesis. These are all gases because it's got the G as a subscript. So you say, great, 
I have to know the partial pressure of all of these things. If for whatever reason ammonia was a solid, then you wouldn't need to know the partial pressure of ammonia, right? You could just use one for the activity, right? So where does this expression come from? Well, we'd like to know the change in free energy as you change other pressure or temperature, right? So if we go back to our ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, right? If we assume it's isothermal, so there's no change in temperature, that means that one goes away. There is no dt if there's no change in temperature. All we have to worry about is the change in pressure, right? So rearranging this equation for pressure, we say that pressure is equal to nRT over V, right? And therefore, if we say that, well, dg equals V dp, and we just solved for an expression for p over here, right? We can take the derivative of that. Right? And all of a sudden we get that dg, sorry, dg, if we take the integral of this side, we're just going to get energy. Over here, we're going to take the integral of nRT over p dp, right? Everything can come out of this integral that's not p, so the n, the r, and the t, and we're left with just the integral of 1 over p, which has a solution which is natural log of p, right? So that's where, so this equals nRT natural log of P. That's where this RT natural log of Q is, right? So that's, that's where this natural log uh, thing comes from. It's just literally, just in a, it's a simplification from the ideal gas law, okay? All right, we already talked what's in air. It's 78% nitrogen gas and 21% oxygen gas, and then less than basically 1% of all else. Fair enough? Okay, so now that we've got delta G for a reaction, the change in free energy for a reaction, all of a sudden we can figure out whether or not something happens or not for a reaction. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left, and we stop me at 5 minutes left, and we'll do the demo regardless of where I'm at. Okay? So real quick, does, let's figure out, we don't have clickers yet, the software's still not working, hopefully we'll get that fixed soon, but tell me whether or not this reaction should happen if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, should the reaction be spontaneous or not? How do we know that? Well, we've got delta H minus T delta S. That's what delta G equals, right? So if delta H is less than zero, right, and delta S is minus a, a positive number, then this has to be a negative number, right? So this delta G must be negative. If delta G is negative, that means the free energy for that reaction went down. If it goes down, then energy got lowered, therefore the universe is happy. It says that reaction goes forward, okay? So this definitely goes forward. We'd say yes, definitely goes forward. What about the next one? This one, it's endothermic, right? So that's a positive value here, minus a negative entropy. Minus a negative is a plus. So this under all temperatures is going to be positive, right? So no, definitely not. What are the next one? This time it's endothermic, but the entropy increases. Will this one go forward? It's going to be plus minus a plus. So will this one go forward? Raise of hands, yes. Raise of hands, no. Raise of hands, it depends. So what's it depend on? It just depends on temperature, right? So this is, for example, ammonia. Ammonia is endothermic, right, at high temperatures, but because it produces entropy, it goes forward, right? Because it produces entropy, okay? So it depends on temp at, um, at high temp. And then the other one is going to be the exact opposite. It's going to be negative minus a negative. And this one is just the opposite at low temp. Okay, fair enough. So just like uh, enthalpy of formation and the, ent and the entropy, the Gibbs free energies are also additive, can be reversed, they can be calculated from constituents. So if we go to our table, this last column, this is the change in free energy of formation of all these things. So just like we do with Hess's law for entropy and enthalpy, we can do that with free energy as well. Okay? Okay, we are almost there. So should we do it for this one? Let's calculate the change in free energy. We've got five minutes left. 
and then we'll switch to do the demo, and we're pretty much on schedule. So let's do it for this one. This is sodium uh, carbonate, NaHCO3. So let's see if we have that. Look under sodium. It's not here. Is it by S? They don't do it by the letter? Oh, they do. Sodium, not here. Na2CO3, that's close. Do I have the values? I don't have the values for that one, do I? We, we'd have to look up the value. It's not here. Maybe it's on the other one. But you'd have to look it up. NaOH is going to have it. NaOH it's got all the values for as a solid, right? And then CO2 it's going to have the values for for sure. So if we had the last one, it's not listed on this table, we could solve this problem, right? So I'll have the TAs actually work through some examples of those for sure. Okay? And there's some on the next homework for sure. So if delta GR for the reaction, delta RG, right? The, ch the change in free energy for the reaction, I'll remind you one more time, is delta RG naught. This is the theoretical component. That's the formation at standard temperature and pressure plus RT natural log of Q, right? This is the experimental, right? If the overall value here is negative, then a reaction takes place. It happens, okay? How would we write the reaction quotient for this reaction? What would it be? Q equals what? Yeah, it's going to be the sodium hydroxide, and that's a solid, so it's just one raised to the one value, meaning we can just pretend it's not there, multiplied by CO2 as a gas, so it's going to be the partial pressure of CO2 raised to the one, and then over just one to the one. So in this case, the reaction quotient is just the partial pressure of CO2. So let me ask you this. If you have a chamber that's pure CO2, right, in terms of gas, there's no other gases present, it's just pure CO2, and then you've got these solids present, will this reaction go forward? It's pure CO2, will the reaction go forward? If it's pure CO2, then what's the partial pressure of CO2? One, right? Products over reactants, right? So then you could write this expression, RT natural log of one. What's natural log of one? Yeah, zero. So that's a problem, right? So basically your experimental component is going to be limiting this reaction, okay? And that should make, yeah, that should make sense. You're not going to add more, basically, unless you have a very strong theoretical driving force, okay? All right, so the sign tells us if negative, spontaneous. If negative, spontaneous. And this is better than entropy and enthalpy because it combines them. That's the takeaway from this chapter. So if we were to start with excess CO2, the reaction will reach equilibrium. Okay, let's talk about equilibrium. Equilibrium is reached when delta Rg equals zero. Does this make sense? So delta Rg tells us whether or not a reaction goes forward. So if that equals zero, then if it goes forward or backwards, it's, it has to go up, right? The delta G, it's, it reach, when it's zero, it's at equilibrium because if it goes, let's see, the change of <laughs> the change of energy for reaction, when if it's not changing anymore, it's at equilibrium because the energy of products going back to reactants and reactants going to products is equal to one another, right? So if you set that equal to zero, you can solve for what the partial pressure should be under equilibrium conditions, okay? Let's do this. Let's look up free energy of this compound. Free energy NaHCO3. Do we have this? Um, NaHCO3. Okay, so they've given us entropy and enthalpy, and those are at standard conditions. So could we use those to calculate the free energy? But raise your hands. Do you think can we can we calculate free energy from those en entropy and enthalpy standard formation values? Raise your hands. Yes. Raise your hands. No. So yes. How do we do it, Jackson? Ja Jake. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, we use the delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So we would do. Let's do it real quick. Let's actually just go through this exercise. Okay. Our reaction was. NaHCO3. Oh, we're out of time, aren't we? Emily, come on up. Let's do the demo. We'll, we'll pick up here next time. This demo is pretty cool. Okay. So we didn't quite get to electrochemistry. We'll start it right at the beginning of next class.
But electrochemistry is the obvious application of thermodynamics. You guys may not care about whether this sodium carbonate reacts with CO2, right? You may not care about that. But as engineers, you better darn well care about whether your steel is going to rust or not under different conditions, right? So electrochemistry is directly analogous to thermodynamics. And to show you that it works, what Emily's constructing, let me flip this camera around. What Emily's constructing here is what's called just a Daniel cell or a penny battery. And what she's putting together is washers that I just bought from Home Depot. There's nothing special about these. I bought some stainless steel washers and I bought some that are zinc plated stainless steel. What, what is zinc plated good for? It's corrosion resistant. By the end of this chapter, we'll know why it is, right? She's stacking those together and you can see that she's taking. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's little white strips of paper between each one that she has soaked in an electrolyte solution. An electrolyte solution is just like what Gatorade says. It's got electrolytes, so it's got ions. In our case, we're just using salt water. So she's taking filter paper, dipped in a little bit of salt water. She's putting it between each of these. She's stacking a bunch of them together. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. And I get the last one. And when yeah. she tops it out and puts the last one on there and then connects the bottom to the top, with an LED, we will see what happens. We're lucky that way. So she's connecting alligator clips to these. Got one side connected. I don't know if I have to turn the lights off. We may have to. Uh, well. If we're lucky. Might. I guess switch it. LEDs only work with voltage one one direction, so you have to switch it because. We should see just using regular metals that this LED will light up. Oh, my hand's in the way. Was it lighting up? It was, but you couldn't see it. And we still got a couple minutes, so we're okay on time. Let's get it going the right way. Can I help? Oh, see that lighting up? Okay, huzzah. So, we will write the reaction for why that was able to light up, why she had to stack eight stacks or six stacks or whatever that is of these things before it would light up, and by the end of the next class period, you'll be able to predict whether or not things will corrode or not when you use them in a different atmosphere. Thanks, sir. This took like eight stacks. It takes it gets, eight for it to work. Uh, it might take one less. It, like, it will reach equilibrium. Right? Yeah, like whatever. It will depend on the theoretical component. Like yes. we know what the we know what the experimental component is because yep. it's gonna be natural. It's gonna be zero, right? Yeah. Well, natural log of one. Yeah, it's, yeah, zero there. So it'll be just whatever the theoretical component says it is. Yeah. So I should have rephrased that. Okay. Yeah, I'll explain it next time. We're gonna calculate this. And another question.